What do Jaden Animations, Smallland, and Keanu Reeves have in common? That's right, they all have friends. And what is the number one thing you want to do with your friends? Exactly, a Pokemon Soul Link. But I don't have any friends that play Pokemon, and so I did what everybody would do and did it all on my own. Hi, for those who don't know me, my name is Ryo, and I like to make Pokemon games harder than they have to be. And today, I'm going to attempt winning a hardcore Soul Link Nuzlocke in Pokemon Soul Silver all on my own. Say that one three times in a row. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, let me explain. A Soul Link is a Pokemon challenge where two players try to beat Pokemon with all of their encounters being linked to each other. If one of them dies, so does the other. Now, since I was alone, I had to make some adjustments to this rule set. It basically works as follows. Every two consecutive encounters I get in the game are linked to each other. This means that if I want to put one of them on my party, I have to add the other one as well. And like in a regular Soul Link, if one of them dies, so does the other. To make it even harder, I also made this run a hardcore Nuzlocke. Aside from the standard rules, like if a Pokemon faints, it can no longer be used, and that I can only catch the first valid encounter per route, I'm also not allowed to use any healing items in battle, have to play on set mode, and cannot overlevel the next gym leader's ace before the start of the battle. And if I ever black out, I have to restart the run. As mentioned earlier, I love making Pokemon games harder than they have to be, so if you enjoy this kind of content, please consider to like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it, and it goes a long way. This whole story begins in a slumbering Newbark town. After saying my last goodbyes to mother, I headed directly to Professor Elm's lab to pick up my very first Pokemon. He ignores all of my concerns about the guy staring right at us through the window and offers me to pick one of the three starters instead. I went with Cyndaquil because it is the most promising of them all. Unfortunately, I can't nickname the little guy just yet. After visiting Mr. Pokemon and Professor Oak, I stumbled over the weird spy from earlier. Turns out he has stolen one of the Pokemon from the lab and challenges me for a battle. Then I headed back to Professor Elm to find the police putting out a warrant for our newly found rival Dan. With that, I'm off to my adventure of becoming the Johto champion. The next thing on my list was to get some new team members. The first of which was a Pidgey in Route 29. With that, I could now also name my starter. So here are Cindy and Sydney. They are linked and will be together forever. So again, if one of them dies, so does the other. If one of them is on the team, so has to be the other. Pretty simple. I then also picked up a Rattata in Route 46 and Bellsprout in Route 31. Beltat and Rattout. I made it to my first destination in Violet City. That is also where I got Woad the Whooper by answering some of Primo's questions in the Pokemon Center. I linked the little guy to Geop the Geodude from the Dark Cave. After clearing the Sprout Tower with ease, I finally got access to the first gym. My team was ready and so I headed right in to challenge leader Faulkner and his flying type Pokemon. He leads the battle with Pidgey as I send in Geo. The bird then immediately throws sand at my pet rock and so she misses her rock throw. But after shrugging off a soft tackle, she connects and manages to one-shot Faulkner's first Pokemon. This brings his ace and last Pokemon out next. It got some decent amount of damage in with Gust as I hit a tackle. No idea why I didn't go for a rock throw here as that would probably just one-shot as well. I then decided to ignore the better move once again and went for a defense curl for literally no reason because the gust Pijoto keeps using is a special move. So after getting hit for a third time, I decided to actually play the game properly and one-shot Faulkner's Pijoto with a rock throw. I don't know, maybe I just wanted to make it more dramatic. Anyway, that's one badge down. The next gym isn't too far from here and so I headed right towards Azela Town. Before reaching it, I came across these two shady guys blocking the entrance to a well. I soon learned that they are part of Team Rocket and are there to cut off Slowpoke tails to sell them. Okay, went all out on the storytelling here, huh? Now I don't know how Slowpokes work, but I'm pretty sure that's not okay. So I jumped right into the well to confront the scariest and cruelest member of Team Rocket, Proton. His words, not mine by the way. Rattout and Woad managed to make quick work of his team, causing Team Rocket to flee. With the crisis averted, nothing was standing in my way of earning my second badge. That is, if nothing is named Dan and challenged me to a battle I definitely 100% knew was going to happen right then and there. Since all of my Pokemon were extremely underleveled, his Croconaw had an easy time to take them out. Listen, if you take away one thing from this video, then that knowing which fights are happening when is a very important skill for Nuzlocke. Funnily enough, I then proceeded to immediately wipe once again. This time around it was even more embarrassing because I lost to Elder Lee in the Sprout Tower simply because I was overconfident and only brought 4 weak Pokemon. This brings me directly to my third attempt. Trust me, I learned from my past mistakes. It's going to be much better now. Since the last naming theme was way too complicated to pull through an entire run, I also decided to switch things up a bit. I made my way through the first gym, back to Azela Town, without any major hiccups, and here are the Pokemon I got along the way. Adam and Eve, Paris and Helenus, Patroclus and Achilles, Bonnie and Clyde, 
Simba and Nalo, and finally, Juliet and Romeo. After defeating Team Rocket in the Slowpoke Well for a second time, I skillfully avoided the rival battle that ended my first attempt by simply not walking there. This allowed me to finally challenge the second gym. It took me a while to figure out the puzzle to get there, but I eventually reached Bugsy. His Cypher's high speed and attack stat can be a big issue if not planned around properly. Top that with the Technician ability, which doubles the power of all moves with up to 40 damage and give the bug catcher two more Pokemon to sponge damage and you got yourself a pretty scary fight. Let's see if I can make it out of this one in one piece. Bugsy brings out his ace first, which threw me off because that's pretty uncommon for gym leaders. I matched the Mantis with Adam, who after taking some damage from Quick Attack, retaliates with a hard-hitting Ember. We repeated the cycle once more and both of our Pokémon were now in the yellow. Unfortunately, a Health Citrus Berry immediately heals my rival back to half health. Adam was now way too low to stay in and so I brought out Paris. Luckily, the Mantis gave me a free switch and only went for Focus Energy, increasing its critical hit ratio. On the next turn, a Quick Attack brings Paris to half right before a Gust takes Cypher back to the yellow. This forces me to switch once again and so I brought out my secret weapon Helenus, who barely takes any damage from Quick Attack and finishes the Mantis off with a Rock Throw. The following Metapod and Kakuna literally have no way of doing any significant damage as they are usually supposed to tank hits for Cypher, but Bugsy never went for U-turn to bring them in and so my team was able to pick up a win without a problem. That's badge number 2. This now also means that my level cap was high enough to have a fighting chance against my rival Dan. I picked up the couples I thought would match up best against his team and headed straight into the battle. Ghastly was up first and I leaked Clyde into it. Dan only went for a mean look as an extra sensory immediately takes his first Pokemon out in one hit. This now brings in his Croconaw, which can be quite scary at this stage of the game. Bonnie was probably the best option to deal with this, so I brought her in on a scary phase. This harshly lowers her speed, but Croconaw decided to go for another round as Flaffy connects with a Thunder Wave. I wanted to reset my Flaffy's stat drops and brought out Petroclus, who took quite some damage from a bite. He then retaliates with a Vine Whip, while another bite brings him down to the yellow. Since he was now in kill range, I switched him out into Bonnie, who immediately gets crit to low health. Funny how Croconon never got fully paralyzed in 3 turns and then also gets a crit? My team definitely didn't look too well right now and so I had to go for some risky plays. I swapped Helenus in as he luckily only gets his speed drop. This baits out a super effective water gun which deals less damage due to my opponent's low special attack. I used this opportunity to switch into Paris as the full para finally strikes allowing my bird to stay at full health. I then managed to bring Croconaut down to the red with 3 consecutive gusts, while it only went for scary faces to even out the speed difference. After taking a water gun, one quick attack finally takes this monster of an ace down. Subet was out last and so I switched into Clyde who gets confused by Supersonic right away. He then proceeds to hit himself in confusion and gets hit by a bite before finally connecting a yawn. From there I switched into Helenus and a super effective rock throw wins me the second battle against Dan. This could have gone a lot smoother to be honest, but I'm still learning to find the optimal pass through fights like this, so no deaths is already an A plus win in my book. With this obstacle out of the way, I get access to Elex Forest, and after solving this beautiful far-fetched puzzle, I arrived at Goldenrod City. I picked up some useful TMs in the department store and then completed a tiny little quiz on my very first attempt. It did not at all take me at least 10 attempts to get all of this right. After definitely not copying my answers, Whitney finally managed to solve the quiz all on her own and headed right back to do her job at the Goldenrod Gym. She only has two Pokemon and we can technically bring six of our own. But her team has so many ways of wiping me. It can anchor my Pokemon to always use the same move and then use Metronome to magically pull out any move in the game. It also has the Q Charm ability. If I use any contact moves, there's a 30% chance my male Pokemon will just fall in love with it and randomly start missing attacks. Her Ace Milk Tank also uses a very similar strategy with Attract, but on top of that, is extremely tanky, can heal itself with Milk Drink, and can deal massive damage with Rollout and Stab Boost at Stomps. So yeah, definitely not too easy to beat. I then tried to stall some time with Voltorb Flip, but was so bad at it that losing to Whitney would probably be a better look for me. After some theory crafting, I came up with a strategy that could work, RNG is not too mean to my Pokemon. Zubat was up first to immediately taunt a Clefairy and prevent it from going for any of the three status moves. This allowed me to switch into Nalo, who tanks a double slap and gets some chip damage in with confusion. He then tanked some more slaps and after hitting a yawn, I could safely switch into Helenus for my setup strategy. Clefairy then went on to sleep for the max amount of turns, which allowed me to boost my defense stat with four defense curls. 
After that, I went for a high magnitude roll, which brings the fairy down to literally 1 HP before it barely leaves the dent with a double slap. Within that waste the super potion to bring a Pokemon back to full, and from there, three more magnitudes were enough to take it out. Next up was a really long back and forth between Helena's and Milk Tank. I'll spare you the details here, but it was mostly Geodude ignoring commands due to infatuation, and Whitney healing her tanky cow back to full once it got low. This ultimately left both Pokemon with barely any HP on the board. I was sure everyone on my team would just take too much damage, and so I stayed in as Milk Tank gets the flinch and a weak stomp. I was down to the red and tried my luck again, but Whitney's ace outspeeds, and another stomp was enough to take Helena's out. With his linked soul down, I sent in Paris to try and revenge his fall in love. A stomp brings him down to almost half health as a gust barely scratches Milk Tank. Then Paris gets hit by an attract and completely ignores the love of his life laying dead on the ground and his trainer. On the next turn, another stomp brought him down to 8 HP as Gus takes Milk Tank down to the red as well. From there, all it took was reminding Paris of his lost love, so he connects with a quick attack to end a way too complicated third gym battle. Helena's going down does not only mark my first death of this attempt, but also seals Paris' fate as well. The next goal of my journey was Acritique City to earn my final badge before the game opens up a lot more. I made a short stop in the national park to catch a partner for Ron the Weedle who I encountered in the Elex Forest. Kim turned out to be a Sun Kern, so this pair was unfortunately very stoppable. Get it? Ron stoppable? Like the character from the show? To continue with some funny things, I also managed to lose an extremely strong couple to a Sudowoodo blocking my way to the next city. I switched Nalo in for a yawn while the Mimic Tree was on low health, but she unfortunately hit for way more damage than I had anticipated. With her good type combination and great move coverage, I had already planned to use Crobat and Slowbro for quite some key battles throughout the run, so this one hit just a little bit different. Simba then took the moving tree out before entering his eternal slumber together with Nalo. On the positive side, I managed to get Odin the Nidoran on Route 36, who I paired up with Freya the Vulpix from Route 37. At this point, I started trying to plan my encounters a little bit better to avoid having to bring dead weight to important battles. I already thought Odin and Freya were pretty good, but then realized that the evolution stones are barely obtainable before the Elite Four, so I couldn't really evolve them. Another good couple I could get right now was Gyarados and Magneton, and so I fished up Caesar in Acritique City and got this weird looking Magnemite in Route 38 and named him Cleopedro. Before being able to head into the gym, I had to face Dan in the Burnt Tower once again. My team has gotten way stronger and diverse now, so these fights shouldn't be too much of a problem from here on out. I accidentally lead the battle with Bonnie and so I'm forced to bring in Gyarados right away. After getting hit by a curse on the switch, a bite was enough to take my rival's first Pokemon out. He then brings in his Magnemite and so I go to Adam to one shot with a Flame Wheel. Third was Croconaw and so I sent out Bonnie to tank the incoming Water Gun and from there Thunder Wave and Thunder Shock took the Crocodile out. Last was Zubat, but it too gets sent back to its Pokeball in no time. I then got to free the legendary beasts resting at the bottom of the tower. After being awoken, all three of them flee the tower and that's pretty much everything I needed to do before being able to take on Morty. Being the ghost type gym leader, his Pokemon are quite frail but also pretty fast. On top of that, they all carry various ways of disrupting my team like a combination of Curse and Mean Look or continuous chip damage while preventing my Pokemon from switching out or Hypnosis to put them to sleep. Luckily they almost have no way of hitting normal type Pokemon, so this wasn't too difficult to plan for. Especially because I managed to put together some pretty solid links so far. Well aside from the obvious electric type weakness over there. So let's earn a quick fourth batch, shall we? Morty leads the battle with Ghastly as I bring out my trusted starter. I outspeed and land a critical hit flame wheel for a clean one shot and a good start into the fight. I was expecting a Shadow Ball here and so I switched into Eve only to get put to sleep by Hypnosis instead. I then switched her out for Clyde who gets locked into place by a mean look. That wasn't really an issue though because Gengar's only attacking moves are Shadow Ball which can't hit normal types and Sucker Punch which fails if I don't attack. This mean looking Clefable then misses a Hypnosis before allowing me to hit a Yawn. Gengar was now asleep, which allows me to take it out with two extra sensory. Third was Haunter, so I went to Caesar to deal with it, but it unfortunately got put to sleep right away. Since it didn't want to wake up, I switched into Adam as Haunter misses a Dream Eater. On the next turn, it goes down to a Flame Wheel, which brings out Morty's final Pokemon. Another Haunter. This guy really seems to like the Gengar line, huh? Since it is really frail and only went for Nightshade, the battle was over after two more flame wheels. So far, this was the easiest gym. As mentioned earlier, the map opens up a lot more from here on out, allowing me to take on the next three gyms in any order I want. Well, this is a pretty neat idea on paper, it also means that the game's balancing and difficulty curve is pretty much non-existent. Because of that, the level cap for those three battles are very close together, 
so I had to plan my route properly instead of just wandering around like I had done up to this point. Since Chuck and Jasmine were somewhat connected through lore, I decided to do them first. Before heading there, I took a short detour to quickly grab Link the Fiero to marry Princess Zelda from the Burnt Tower. These freed up my encounters, which allowed me to get an outstanding duo next. Davy Jones, the actual Magnemite from Route 39, and Calypso, the Lapras, from the bottom of the Union Cave. They were an extremely valuable pair for this run, which already made me feel like there is not a lot that could go wrong anymore. I then fought all the trainers in the Glittering Lighthouse until I reached Jasmine, who was tending to Amphi, that required some medicine from Sianwood City. So after a quick surfing adventure, I eventually reached the slumbering coastal town, with the fifth badge already waiting for me. Chuck literally only has two Pokemon, and both of them have no way of covering their weaknesses, so he might be the first one to dethrone Morty for the easiest gym. I decided to change my team up a bit, due to Adam and Eve both being weak to water and fighting, respectively, and brought Romeo and Juliet instead. To be fair, Chuck might seem like he has a very easy team, but you could not underestimate a man who knows the value of meditating while letting the shower water massage your back. I had no choice but to interrupt this sacred practice and to challenge this wise man to a battle. He starts off with Primeape as I bring my newly evolved Jump Bluff out for her debut battle. She outspeeds and manages to hit a Leech Seed as the monkey boosts its evasion with Double Team. To disrupt it even more, I went for a Stun Spore, all while Chucky still didn't manage to land a hit as he decided to go for a Leer instead. I felt way too comfy here and went for a Mega Drain, which did massive damage due to a crit, right before getting humbled by a hard-hitting Rock Slide. I was sure Chuck would heal now, and so it was safe to go for another Mega Drain. Staying in even longer was way too risky now, and so I switched out Juliet for a Romeo. He immediately gets hit by a Rock Slide, but Leech Seed managed to recover at least half of the damage. This also has to be like the fifth turn of Primeap not getting a single full para, but okay. On the next turn I went for a Stockpile to boost my defenses, and Primeap hits yet another 90% accurate Rock Slide through the Paralysis. After repeating the same turn once again, I went for a Swallow to heal Romeo back to full as Primeap finally gets fully paralyzed. The Fighting Ball of Fur was now low enough to fall to a single crunch due to the consistent chip damage from Leech Seed. This brings out Chuck's ace and final Pokemon Polybreath. I wanted to switch into Bonnie, but she got immediately paralyzed by a Body Slam, and so I brought out Caesar on a Focus Punch. From there, a Dragon Rage did approximately one-third of my opponent's health, as he misses a Hypnosis. Another Dragon Rage brought Polybreath down to the yellow, which activates its Citrus Berry before he can retaliate with a weak Surf. From there, I eventually brought the Boxer down to the red, as he misses yet another Hypnosis. Greed then got the better of me, because I went for a Tackle, as Chuck heals Polyrath back to full, basically resetting all of my progress. Luckily, Gyarados survived the following two turns on 12 HP, allowing him to get Polyrath back to low health. I then switched into Romeo, but he gets fully paralyzed by a Body Slam right away. This fight truly is much harder than it has to be. On the next turn, Romeo tanks a Surf, dodges the full para, and hits an Acid to eventually win me the most tedious battle of the run. But hey, there is always a bright side. I could now pick up the medicine from the Apothecary in Cyanwood and brought it straight to Amphi. Since the little guy was now cured, Jasmine headed back to the gym, which immediately brings me to the next battle. I put Adam and Eve back on the team and added Megara the Tentacruel and Zagreus the Kingler, who I both picked up on my way to Cyanwood City. I lead the battle with Cyndaquil into Jasmine's Magnemite, which allows me to immediately take it out with a super effective Lava Plume. This brings out her Ace Steelix next, which despite having a massive physical defense, is quite weak when it comes to absorbing special attacks. On the next turn, I got a free switch into Megara, as Steelix attempted to lower her speed with a Screech, but her clear body ability allows her to ignore all negative stat changes from enemy attacks. From there, it took only one Surf to take the big Steel Noodle out, which left Jasmine with only her Magnemite on the board. A switch into Adam and a final Lava Plume then allowed me to pick up a quick badge. There are a few things to complete before I can continue with the story. I needed to pick up a pair that could potentially make it all the way to the Elite Four. When heading towards Cyanwood earlier, I ran into a Lampert who by itself is already a pretty good Pokemon. I then skipped all the encounters I could get to potentially be able to link the little guy to a stronger partner instead of a random Pokemon. By manipulating my encounters with Repel, and after running around for a solid 10 minutes, I eventually found this happy steel formation in the cliff cave. Meet Johnny and Baby. Probably one of the strongest pairs yet. This was pretty much about everything I needed to do for now, which brings me directly to the late game content in Mahogany Town. From there, I made my way straight to the Lake of Rage. This is also where I ran into the infamous shiny Gyarados, which I killed because I already had one, and because I needed my encounter for this area to stay available until much later in the game. That reckless behavior didn't really sit well with my newly acquired Dragon Tamer friend. 
But since we're more than besties now, Lance decided to redirect his anger by letting his Dragonite hyperbeam a random civilian instead. We then teamed up to infiltrate a secret Team Rocket hideout, which ended with a double battle against Rocket Executive Ariana and a regular Grunt. But their Pokemon for some reason are level 25 and ours were around the 40s, so that was really straightforward to beat. On my way out I picked up an Electrode that I matched up with a Pineco from the Safari Zone. There was now only one thing left to do in Mahogany. Defeat Price for the 7th batch. He's using a bunch of Ice-type Pokemon, which by itself is already one of the weakest types, and his team doesn't really make up for that. After pushing those Ice Blocks around for way longer than I would like to admit, it eventually clicked, and I was able to finally take on the Gym Leader. The old man leads the battle with Seal, and here's Johnny. A Charge Beam cleanly knocks the Sea Puppy out, which then brings in Piloswine to threaten Lantern with a stat-boosted Mud Bomb. A Bubble Beam then takes it down to the yellow, which activates its Citrus Berry. It then hits the anticipated Mud Bomb for 50% of Johnny's health, and so I was forced to bring out Calypso on the next turn, who tanks the incoming Mud Bomb without a problem. I was faster, and so a single Water Pulse takes it out immediately. Dugong was out last, and after taking literally no damage from an Aurora Beam, Johnny hits a Confuse Ray. Since I was in a pretty safe position here, I kept continuously spamming Water Pulse, which after healing the Seal back to full twice, eventually brought him down to the yellow. I mean, I could have just gone for a Paris song and immediately switch out, but it was probably just more fun watching Dugon's health bar go down to the red and then back to full three times in a row. After a rest from the CL, I realized that this back and forth was probably not gonna end well, and so I had to switch into Davy Jones. The Dugon then hits itself in confusion, as the Thundershock does way more than half. On the next turn, it hits itself in confusion once again, and Davy sealed its fate for good. Upon defeating Price, Professor Elm calls me to tell me about a strange radio broadcast mentioning Team Rocket. It was up to me to save the day once again, and so I headed straight to Goldenrod. I never had the chance to play this game when it came out, and my last time playing Gen 2 was probably more than 10 years ago, so it took me a while to figure out how to get past this one guard blocking my way into the radio tower. I eventually figured out that Team Rocket ran out of uniforms for their current operation, and so this grunt and I just borrowed some from the photo studio they set up below the city. My disguise didn't really last that long though, since Dan unmasks me right before I can enter the tower. After taking out a bunch of grunts, I had to defeat Proton and his team of toxic air balloons, but Adam was able to easily sweep through it. There is pretty much nothing that can stop us right now. Proton then hands me the basement keys for the radio station, because that was the only way to get access to the rest of the Team Rocket leaders. As soon as I enter, Dan storms into the room to challenge me for yet another threatening fight. Wouldn't it be silly if I also didn't expect this battle to happen and got caught completely off guard? Wouldn't that be silly? Well, my rival brings out his Golbat, and since I came very prepared, I send out Adam first. I switched into Calypso, and he immediately gets hit by a Confuse Ray, and as one does, proceeds to hit himself in confusion three times in a row. He was now way too low, and so I swapped him out for Davy Jones instead. He takes an air cutter on the switch and brings the bat down to the red with a Thundershock. Magneton then sends my opponent's first Pokémon back to its Pokéball, which brings Dance for Alligator out next. A Thundershock brings it down to half health, as it barely manages to touch Davy with a Water Gun. The Lord of the Deep then proceeds to wipe Dan's ace off the battlefield with a following Thundershock. Haunter was out next, and so I had the brilliant idea to switch into Eve. If you haven't noticed yet, this is going to be my trademark misplay of the run. Just watch. My plan was for her to stall out Haunter, since it had no way of dealing any damage, because Ghost couldn't hit normal types. What I didn't think of was that this beautiful Pokémon wasn't planning on killing me with damage, but instead slowly drained the life out of my ferret with a combination of Curse and Mean Look. So on the switch, Haunter brings itself to half health, and with that, curses my little rat. I was sure a Sucker Punch would kill, but Dan had other plans and blocked me from switching with Mean Look, causing my attack to fail. A single hit from Eve would kill here, but Haunter went for a Confuse Ray instead, which again caused my Sucker Punch to fail miserably, all while Curse slowly whittled her down turn by turn. I then finally went for a Surf, but it was too late. The Curse brought Eve down to 2 HP, and since Haunter would outspeed, I was forced to go for a Sucker Punch again. But it wasn't enough as Ferret hits herself in confusion and seals her and Adam's fate with it. She really wanted to honor her name there, huh? I then bring in my starter for one last time to revenge kill Dan's remaining team with the burning fire inside of him. I put Caesar and Cleopatra back on my team and proceeded to raise every last Team Rocket executive in the radio tower. With that, the evil team's plans were ruined and the world was safe once again. Remember when I was talking about needing the rest of my encounters later in the game? Well, now it's later in the game. With the last gym inside, I started planning for the Elite Four, and so I traveled to the remaining routes to create pairs that could take on that challenge. I headed back to Route 47 to slam my dead Slowpoke against a tree until a Pokémon fell out. 
The first thing I came across was a Hoot Hoot who was not really what I was looking for. I named her Marge and after continuously throwing Nalo into the forest at Route 48, I eventually got an Execute. Unfortunately, pairing those two would be disastrous and so I killed the basket of eggs to potentially meet him in another area. From there it was straight to Mahogany Town where I hadn't picked up any encounters yet. I then used Homer the Machop from Mount Mordor to clear my encounter list. With that, I was able to headbutt the trees in Route 43 and eventually ran into Blake the Execute. After killing the Apom from Route 44, I had no encounters left to pick up and so I was forced to move on with my adventure for now. I skillfully avoided all of the Pokemon inside of the Ice Path with Repels, which now brings me to Blackthorn City. This gives me access to Route 45 and another chance to find a good match for Blake. So I picked up Nalo again, slammed him into the tree one last time and actually found what I was looking for. Wait, not that one. Ryan the Heracross. That's about everything I needed to do to end this run. Well, almost. I was still missing the 8th batch. For some reason, this gym puzzle too took me way too long to solve. I eventually found my way to Claire and it was time to duel. Or something. She starts off strong and brings in her massive Gyarados, who I matched with my trusted Davy Jones. He gets hit by a Dragon Rage right away, before shooting my opponent's first Pokemon right out of the sky. Dragonair was out next, which I assume had Fire Blast, and so I immediately went into Calypso, who for some reason gets hit by a Thunder Wave on the Switch. Maybe Claire was onto my plans all along. I decided to risk the full para and went for an Ice Beam instead. After getting hit by a Dragon Pulse, Lapras pulls through, one-shotting the Pool Noodle in one hit. Next was Claire's second Dragonair, but it quickly follows suit. Last was Kingdra. It was threatening my team with Sniper Boosted Hyper Beam and Dragon Pulse crits, so I couldn't just carelessly blast away on this thing. I didn't want to risk any of my better Pokemon, so I brought in Juliet, who tanked the Dragon Pulse pretty well. A Mega Drain healed back some of her health before another Dragon Pulse brings her down to 26 HP. On the next turn, I brought in Gyarados to shrug off the incoming Hydro Pump. Caesar then connects with an Ice Fang, bringing the Seahorse into the range that activates its Citrus Berry before getting his accuracy lowered by a smoke screen. I wanted to test my luck with Dragon Rage, which actually hits, as Kingdra only went for yet another smoke screen. After missing my third attack, Gyarados then luckily survived the incoming Hyper Beam. With two accuracy drops, it was too risky to stay in now, and so I used the Recharge from Hydro Pump to get a free switch onto Davy Jones. He then proceeds to face tank a Hydro Pump, which leaves him with 4 HP on the board, before a final discharge takes Kingdra out. After dealing with another gym leader not wanting to hand over her badge, my team and I were ready for the end. There were some minor things to do before I could head over to Victory Road. One of them was participating in a Pokeathlon for several hours until I earned enough points to obtain a Leaf Stone and evolve Execute into an Exeggutor. After that, I defeated all of the Kimono girls in Ecrotic City before throwing my Master Ball at this weird chicken I found in the underwater biome. The last of my tasks was to battle Dan for one last time. Not only had he managed to end my run before, but his Haunter also ripped our beloved starter, who was with us from the very beginning from us, with his cold and ghostly hands. There was no mercy left for him inside of me. This was it, our final showdown. First up, was his Sneasel into Baby. He takes a solid 2 damage from a Fury Swipes before diving under and eliminating Dan's first Pokemon with all his might. Next was for Alligator and so I brought out Calypso, who after tanking a Waterfall in a Crunch, sets up a Parish Song. With that, all Pokemon hearing this song will faint after 3 turns, unless they switch out. Lapras then also confused the Alligator before switching into Johnny. With Feraligator's Parish Counter down to 1, I tanked its final attack and set up a Stockpile for some defensive boosts but then the AI caught me off guard and switched out instead. Something I definitely didn't know could happen. Dan still isn't the best trainer of them all and went into Magneton. So I went for another stockpile before Magneton heals Johnny back to full HP with a Thunder Wave. Then the Surf left the Magnet with 1 HP as he misses a Super Sonic. With another Surf, Johnny was able to take Magneton out, which then brings in Feraligator for some reason. It could only get in a soft crunch before falling to a single discharge. Third was Golbat, but it too falls to a single attack. At this point, Dan is just throwing the battle for us, I guess. Fourth was Haunter, so I switched into Steelix and a Confuse Ray. It yet again tried to go for some curse shenanigans, but Baby has no mercy and annihilates it with a crunch. Dan's last Pokemon was Kadabra, who disabled my crunch before I was able to use it. That's when I decided to bring in Cleopedro, because all he had done so far was watch his better half do all the work for him but all the time he was lurking in the shadows was not spent idling around. It was preparation for this very moment. To show the world what true strength could look like. To show the world the power of Leak. Anyway, Kadabra then gives me a free switch, as it only sets up a Reflect. Cleopedro then proceeds to show his miraculous techniques, 
as he hits a massive Night Slash for what has to be over 95% of Kadabra's health. After that, another Slash was all it took to end the battle. With that, the Indigo Plateau was in sight. Five more fights against the strongest and fiercest opponents of the region were all that was standing between me and the end of this challenge. I tried building the best team possible and ultimately ended up bringing the following three couples. Ryan and Blake, Davy Jones and Calypso, Baby and Johnny. Let's see if all my encounter and team planning has paid off. With everyone ready to go, all that was left for me to do was enter the final challenge of the run. First up was Will and his Psychic-type Pokémon, who were definitely more of a challenge than I had hoped for. He leads the battle with his Xatu, so I brought in Baby. After stealing my attack with me first and barely dealing any damage, Steelix crunches his opponent down to the red. Xatu then manages to confuse Baby, but he doesn't know what that is and just chomps the bird back to its Pokéball. Second was Slowbro, who only went for an Amnesia as I switched into Johnny. A Discharge brings it down to low health before it lands a critical hit Psychic. But since Johnny outspeeds, another Discharge was enough to take Slowbro out. Third was Execute. I couldn't stay in and so I brought Steelix back in, who gets immediately put to sleep by a Hypnosis. What follows is a needlessly stretched out war against sleep and special defense drops, which ultimately ends with both Steelix and Executor in the yellow. There was no way he could stay in here and since I was expecting a Hypnosis, I switched into Ryan, who could easily dodge the move because he was already poisoned before the battle. But Will probably saw a kill with Psychic instead and so my fighting Scara takes a big hit right away. My team wasn't looking amazing here, I have to say. Three of them were already in the yellow. My only way out was switch into Calypso and pray. She survived the Psychic and dodged the Hypnosis before taking Will's annoying third Pokémon out with an Ice Beam. Two more to go. Sleep seems to be a very common theme in this battle, as Lapras falls victim to one of Jinx's lovely kisses. I then brought out Davy Jones, who also gets put to sleep. But then after taking two more Psychics, Davy manages to wake up just in time to hit an insane discharge, taking Jinx out and sending her right back to her Pokeball. With that, there was only Will's second Xatu left. Davy then luckily dodged the Psychic crit right before taking it out in one go. That was fun and totally went according to plan. Second was Koga. His lead Ariados immediately goes down to low health with an Earthquake from Baby before restoring a bit of its health with a Giga Drain. I was sure Koga was going to heal next and so I went for a Dragon Pulse for some chip damage, but Ariados went for a Giga Drain instead. With the Spider now in the red, Koga then actually used the predicted full restore, while a Dragon Pulse got the Spider low enough for it to fall to an Earthquake on the following turn. Next up was Fortress. Baby got some damage in with Earthquake, but it wasn't going to be enough, and so I brought in Ryan on a Protect to one-shot with a close combat. This now baits in Crobat, so I had to switch once again. Davy easily shrugs off two wing attacks before one-shotting both the Golbat and the following Venom off with a Discharge. Last was Muck, but it literally had no way of hitting me, and so I kept spamming Discharge for a clean second win. Over the last year, Nintendo conditioned us to not talk about the third member of the Elite Four, but here he is. Hitmontop was up first and so I brought in Ryan. He was pre-poisoned because he has the Guts ability. This basically gives him a 50% attack boost if he is affected by a status condition. Combine that with Facade's secondary effect of doubling its damage under the same conditions and top it off with Heracross's high attack and you got yourself a pretty dangerous Egyptian bug. Needless to say that Bruno's entire team won a free ticket to One-Shot City. Fourth was Karen and her Dark-type Pokémon. And if you have paid attention to my last lecture about why Guts is probably one of the most broken abilities in the game, then you already know what is coming next. Umbreon, Murkrow, Houndoom, Gengar and Valplume all got deleted with 6 attacks. And with that, I reached the end. At this point I was feeling very confident. Maybe a little too confident. Because the game had one last card up its sleeve, Lance. That's right, the soul I was bound to link with. The Johto champion that straight up hyperbeamed the guy. And so, to end it all, I walked through the golden halls, we locked eyes, and the battle began. Up first was Gyarados as I sent out the Lord of the Sea for one last time. He takes a third from Waterfall but retaliates with a discharge, taking Lance's first Pokémon out. 1-0. Next was Charizard and it was threatening to kill Davy with a super effective fire thing. But he pulls through and survived on 16 HP before sniping the wannabe dragon out of the sky. 2-0. This now brings out the first of Lance's three Dragonites. It was the one with Fire Blast and I was pretty sure it would go for that move and so I brought out Calypso to tank the hit. He tanks it pretty well and after taking way too much damage from an Outrage, connects with an Ice Beam for a clean kill. 3-0. So far so good. 
Third was Aerodactyl, so I brought out Johnny on a soft air release. Lands out speeds and hits a rock slide, which luckily doesn't crit, allowing me to retaliate with a discharge which barely misses out on the kill. With three of my Pokemon in the red, I had to make some sacrifices to be able to win this run. Johnny's time had finally come. 3-1. It only felt fair to bring in Baby next to make the most of his lost soul. Aerodactyl then barely leaves a mark with an air lace before falling to a single crunch. 4-1. There were only two Dragonites left. Lance then sends in the one with Blizzard, who actually manages to connect with a 70% accurate move, taking a big chunk out of Baby's health. On the next turn, the Orange Dragon misses a Blizzard, which allows me to bring it right below half health. Then right as I thought Baby's time had come as well, his Quick Claw procs, allowing him to move first and hit a critical hit Dragon Pulse, which Dragonite then survives on literally 1 HP, right before missing yet another Blizzard. After a full restore and two more Dragon Pulse, Lance's Dragon was now back to half health. Baby was way too low, and with Johnny dead, there was no point in switching him out. So he too falls to Lance's Mighty Dragons. 4-2. With one linked pair down, it was time to bring out the big guns. Luckily, Ryan outspeeds and manages to bring Lance down to his final Dragonite. My best option was to go for a facade here, but it unfortunately leaves Lance's dragon in the yellow. It then retaliates with a Dragon Rush, but Ryan hangs on with 13 HP after the poison damage, outspeeds and ends the battle with a final facade. And that's it. I managed to become the Johto champion in a Soul Link Hardcore Nuzlocke all on my own. Team building was a big part of this challenge and I had tons of fun planning out battles while having to think about all of the links as well. If you enjoyed this video, please consider to like and subscribe. It goes a long way. Thanks for watching.